Now, starting with um, the, the big picture of the economy, uh, fundamentally, as Professor Stiglitz identified, you know, the world economy is now recovering after an, an extremely sharp decline, unprecedented almost, uh, during a, as a result of the GFC, we've seen really a very, very sharp bounce back in global economic activity. But, uh, it's the Asia-Pacific markets in particular that have benefited from that bounce back, a slowing expected but still uh, above the, the global average, whereas uh, the US really struggling to, to regain any sort of momentum in the short term, and Europe in particular lagging well behind most of the other global regions. Quite clearly in this part of the world, um, we are expecting to see really quite robust, quite healthy levels of growth going forward at least over the next couple of years. So, what's the problem? That all sounds extremely positive. Yep, there are some difficulties going on in Europe, but as far as Asia Pacific is concerned, the picture looks um, exceedingly promising. Well, potentially yes, but one of the most important things to bear in mind is uh, Professor Stiglitz referred to it as partial decoupling. The key issue is that economies in this part of the world are still actually closely and integrally linked to what's happening in the rest of the world. And as we look at the outlook for Europe and the US, the key issue is uncertainty. There are key issues around whether or not the Western economic recovery in the US and Europe that has started to gain some traction in some areas is actually going to be sustained. There are the existing global imbalances which fundamentally underpinned the flows of capital around the world which themselves were ultimately responsible for the global financial crisis. Those imbalances have not gone away. We are seeing a lot of debate at the moment around exchange rates, which is actually just one part of a far wider issue around those global trade imbalances. A particular issue in, certainly as far as Europe is concerned and to an extent the US, are government deficits and the austerity packages that are being put in place to try and control those deficits. One of the key concerns with the great differential in interest rates and returns that we see around the world is that these are exactly the preconditions for the emergence of asset bubbles uh, in, particularly in, in this part of the world, in fixed assets that are offering attractive returns. Now, all of this is creating a climate of extreme uncertainty from an investment point of view. Risk aversion is uh, something that is, is not just a, an issue for bond investors, it's prevalent right the way across the investment spectrum. And we can see it very, very clearly feeding through into what's happening in the real estate investment market. And it's that risk aversion that lack of belief that fundamentally we really are going to see a start at a rising tide, growing employment, a general re recovery of demand, not just on the best stock, but into the secondary markets, the lack of that belief is what's holding things back. Once that belief starts to come back, we will see a very sharp change in the way in which those secondary value-add investments are being priced, because that's where the money's there to be made. And at that point, there will be some fantastic returns to be made. Now, the key issue, of course, is not only what should I buy, but, but when. And I think that the big difference is that certainly in terms of employment levels, in terms of uh, uh, activity, leasing activity from corporates, we are now seeing uh, and have seen a really a surprisingly sharp return to positive absorption across most of the Asian markets. In fact, all of the markets that we monitor across the region show positive absorption during the third quarter. So we really are at the turning point in terms of how we see uh, the demand feeding through into uh, the, certainly into the office markets and to a large extent into the retail markets where there are significant numbers of retailers really focused on targeting getting into uh, the, the major markets of the Asia region. And in contrast certainly to the European market, the Asian market is largely domestic. Even at the very most active points, uh, cross-border investment rarely accounting for more than 20, maybe 25% of total investment activity. It's a much more domestic market. In, in almost all periods, there's more capital coming into the region than there is moving from one Asian market to another. And there are potentially lots of reasons and lots of barriers for that, but I do think that as we move through into a period of growth, as we see a freeing up of some of the investment regulations governing institutions around the region, and particularly as increasingly economic wealth is generated in Asia and the best investment opportunities in order to capture the growth from the recovery are in the Asian economies, it'll be very interesting to see whether or not Asian investors start to exploit more of the opportunities that are here in their own region rather than necessarily looking elsewhere in the world. 
So with that, I'll hand over to Francois. And, um, I was very happy when I saw uh, Nick's slide this morning in preparing for this session that actually there's lots of convergence between what he says and what we heard here. Uh, but actually maybe some divergence between uh, what the perception here within this market with the perception uh, from the outside. Mm -hmm. Really, the way we see it is a movement from optimism last year to greater self-confidence this year in the ability of the regional economy to function in and of itself. And so out of this, let me draw two major themes that we gather from, from your opinions. The first one is China is clearly leading the way forward. But the other one is that it's not just about China. And even China in itself is not just a uniform story. It's about the great diversity of the local economies within China and within the region. And it's about taking advantage of these diversities, hence those cross-border flows of investment within the, the continent. Now, there are lots of signs around here, around, around the floor space here, that we are facing a more mature market that we were facing in the past. Now, we're not there yet. It's not a mature economy. It's still a growing, very much so a growing economy. So it is a growth development story. China is not the place for the institutional investor looking for yield. It's a place to look for growth because there remains a limited availability of institutional quality assets. Now, risk remains. This year, much more diverse opinions about the risk. This year, in terms of tier one city, there is speculative activity going on. People seem to feel it's very contained to certain types of property, in particular luxury residential. And because this is such a segmented market, there's not much of a worry of that bubble having a contagion effect on the rest of the economy. I think strong message here from the presentation of various countries of the region uh, and on this podium and on the floor about the growth of the domestic demand. And this is what enables us to, within this region, to disconnect from the demand in the US and demand in, the Europe, in Europe by becoming our big self-contained economic region. And, and that goes around with those growth of um, cross-border capital flows and growth of trade uh, within the region, which is really about taking advantage of the diversity. And that message came out loud and clear this year that we are a diverse uh, continent, a diverse region, and there are opportunities to gain from trade, to gain from diversification by reallocating our portfolio from country-specific to region-specific. And this is what's going to drive the, the cross-border flow that, that you mentioned. I also want to add one piece of data from Real Capital Analytics. This past quarter, the amount of real estate investment coming out of this region was $40 billion, is exactly the same as US, UK, and Germany combined, right? So a lot of activity within the region, a lot of capital coming out of the region. That sense in which self-confidence maturing the market. So there were varieties of stories. Japan, place for the mature market, but still good, strong yield opportunities and maybe some distressed owners or distressed debt that provide opportunities. Taiwan, Korea, promoting a strong domestic economy from tourism maybe in Korea and Taiwan from this uh, renewed interest from the political class in being part of the fight for supremacy within the region as a platform to access uh, China. Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, each with their own economy, their own different drivers, great opportunities for diversification of investment across the region. And then for the first time here at Mipanesia, we hear about Cambodia, we hear about, or at least I hear about Mongolia. So let, let's see what we hear next year. And let's see whether those stories keep going. And, and there was a country mentioned on the, this stage here, Laos, where the statement was that there was no interest yet. Well, let's see if next year that's the one that shows up on, on the table or, or Cambodia and Mongolia stay there. So the key concerns for the region remains macroeconomic stability, which is exchange rate, which is inflation, which is very uh, similar and, and related. And then this international capital flow. The idea that the foreign direct investment coming out of US, coming out of Europe, because it is chasing those returns and it's very nimble, could create disruptions in the local economy. Interestingly, um, listening to people and asking around, we don't hear much about any political instability. And actually, this, this gets to a point about some of the presentation we heard here on this stage about maybe some disconnect between the way the outside world looks at the region and the way the region looks at itself. What I found more interesting from a real estate point of view is, is an, an issue between the local managers and their Western-based headquarters. And this is an issue about misunderstanding 
the economic diversity uh, of the region and paying attention maybe to too many media headlines and too many reports that don't do what Nick did, which is to go down to country-specific uh, data and just lump the whole region into this Asia-Pacific region. To conclude, I want to finish with two, two lessons of things that we missed during our boom in the US and that could have helped us not get into the troubles uh, where we are today. And the first one really goes back to this theme of geographic diversity. You see, during, during the boom in the US, I know it sounds unbelievable, but you can attest it was true. People were saying housing price cannot go down because they've never gone down before. Which sounds silly, just look at England. They went down 40% in 1990 and many other countries. But then the response to that was the US economy is so diverse of a space that the diversity will save the day. And so we were deriving comfort from the fact that Housing prices were 80% up in San Francisco, 20% up in Milwaukee. If something goes wrong in San Francisco, Milwaukee will save the day. Well, no, it just happened that the land price was going up 100% everywhere. We were just translating, because of those different ratios in land to structure component, it was translating into diversity. So that, that just maybe a first lesson that we didn't learn on time. Hopefully we will remember for our next crisis, but I am sure when we talk about this diversity across Asia, we're talking about the real estate market, well, real estate across this market is not the same bundle of land and structure, and the fundamental driver of the valuation of those two components are not the same. So we got fooled. Don't get fooled. There's a lot of the speakers here were talking about affordability in terms of average income relative to average price. But that's not so relevant, in particular in an emerging economy, where what's driving the willingness to pay of the next buyer is not their income. I was in Chongqing in the marketing office of a residential development. Every young household was showing up with grandma, right? And a bunch of cash to put on the table. While we are in an economy where these savings are being translated into real estate investment, we are going to be booming. What I want to say is the day this stops, it doesn't just stop, it's going to crash because on the way, there are people using the capital gains that they make to keep fueling the demand. So, so that's a warning. warning. It's, right now, you're looking very much like the UK in the 80s and the way the US looked in the 2000s. Maybe not so extreme, but very much the same underlying dynamics. Now, we haven't figured out how to avoid a crash and just have a slowdown, right? And so maybe that's, that's something this region can, can try and maybe teach us a lesson. So, so to finish, we started with the title, Growing in an Uncertainty, but maybe our experience or what we heard from you with my students from Hong Kong UST is maybe it's just a growing self-confidence. And, and based on that, I'm really excited to see how this translates into what we will hear next year.